Hi there, and welcome again to AP European History. My name is Paul Sargent, um, and today we're going to take a look at the Russian Revolution that happened during World War I, and we're going to look at the end of the war itself. Um, so let's get started. Russia is always an interesting story, and it gets kind of uh, downplayed throughout European history, um, I think. The Russian Revolution, though, really kind of is where Russia starts to sort of dominate things here. Um, the 1917 sees sort of like the coming of the collapse of the czarist regime. So you've got the, you've got Tsar Nicholas, who's the Romanov, uh, czar of Russia, um, who's running the same kind of autocratic rule that his father had run and that had been, you know, it comes and goes in Russia over time. But Russia had really been unprepared for the war. They didn't have the, the industrial capability that the West have. They didn't have the ability to, uh, to produce guns and things like that. They didn't have efficient railways. They didn't have effective ways of moving food. Um, they just weren't there. And so Nicholas goes to the front lines and leaves influence in St. Petersburg or Petrograd um, to his wife, who's increasingly being uh, uh, influenced by this guy named Rasputin, who uh, there's all kinds of stories about this guy named Rasputin, and they're just pointless to go through. Put it very easily this way. Um, the Tsarina believed that, he, that uh, Rasputin had the ability to stop um, the blood disease that one of her children had. So she basically turned over all kinds of things to him. He started taking over the government. Eventually, he gets assassinated. So there's a March revolution that happens. And this is the first of two revolutions in 1917. It starts in Petrograd with, with some of these problems here. And it starts kind of uh, sporadically. Uh, there, there's no real organization here. Women start to march on March 8th. And there's calls for a general strike where everyone, every, all the workers will go on strike and take to the streets and oppose the regime here. Um, and when Nicholas actually turns the army on the marchers, many of the soldiers refuse to, to, to fight them and join the marchers themselves. That's never a good thing. So what you have then is the control of a provisional government. So, so, so the czar abdicates, steps down, and the provisional government takes over. And you start to see the growth of these things called Soviets, which are like local groups of workers or soldiers or something like that. Basically lower class people coming together. Um, there is a division among many of these, a fight for power between two groups called Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. And both of these can be considered socialist groups. The Bolsheviks are the more, uh, the more radical. They want a communist state here. And, and they're actually going to end up winning. Largely becomes, it's because of this guy, Lenin. Now, Lenin had been in exile in Switzerland, and the German government, thinking that it would be a good idea to maybe weaken the Russian uh, fighting force, ships him, his family, and a few of his followers across Germany and safely delivers them to Russia. So it's almost like introducing a virus into a computer. You know, you know this is going to crash the whole system, and, and so you go and you do it. And Lenin, man, he delivers. So here's a picture of the Women's March, just to give you an idea of the popular support of how this starts. You can draw parallels with the uh, the, the, the Women's March on Versailles during the French Revolution here. Um, and here's Lenin out there speaking to the people, talking about this idea that he has of communism. Um, and then there's Trotsky. Now, Trotsky is going to be around for a little while. He's a fantastic organizer. In fact, he's probably the reason why the Bolsheviks eventually gained control, or at least a very big reason. Um, but he's going to find himself ousted pretty quickly. In October, you have what's called the Bolshevik Revolution, the second of the two revolutions. And it ends up with Bolshevik control of basically the government here. Um, and they created a new government where they called for power to the Soviets. You know, give these small committees the power. Let's not have a centralized government here. And they introduced new social and economic policies. In fact, they talked peace, land, and bread. We're going to get out of the war. We're going to have food. Uh, that's the bread part. And, uh, and we're going to give, we're going to give up ownership of land and let people all take over, which is already kind of happening out in the countryside, but they're just kind of legitimizing the whole thing. In order to do this, they, they create a separate piece. Now, under the Bolshevik revolution, they had actually sent 
uh, directions to soldiers in the on the on, in the field fighting the Germans and Austrians to disobey and overthrow their commanders. And so when Germans attack, lots of times these soldiers just disobeyed their commanders and turned around and left for home. Well, with that going on, you're not going to be able to really make a great peace. So, But to get out of the war, Russia under Lenin uh, negotiates the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, in which they give away a huge, huge portion of land in return for ending the war with Germany. And they got to do this because they're in for a civil war here. And they end up fighting this war for control of Russia between the Bolshevik or Red Army fighting an anti-Bolshevik or White Army. Now, the Bolsheviks have the real power here because not only are they fighting enemies from the outside, but also they have some, some, some weapons on their own side. They institute a thing called the Cheka. Now, it's the long history of a secret police in Russia, and it's, it was abolished when the revolution happened. Now they introduce the Cheka, which is the secret police. It's the exact same thing. And they institute the Red Terror, which is basically we're going to get rid of everybody who opposes us, starting with those people who are in the wrong social classes. Anyone from the upper class, anyone from the bourgeois middle class, they're gone. Um, but there's also a lot of workers who are gone too, based on the fact that they are uh, against the idea here. But the problem with the white army is that they're not unified. They don't have one cause. They're all, some of them want the czar to come back. Some of them want a socialist government that's kind of Western in style. So they can't agree on anything other than the fact that they don't want the Bolsheviks. That's not a good way to run it. The communists are unified and they institute something called war communism, which is kind of a weird idea here. We're going to decentralize the government and give all the power to the Soviets. But in order to get there, we have to centralize the government and take control of everything in order to fight off the opponents that we have so that we can win the war and decentralize the government. It's uh, confusing, but it's necessary and it ends up working. Um, and it's not, uh, it, it certainly helped along by the invasion of allied troops in countries like Britain, uh, the United States, even Japan, send troops into Russia to back up the white armies. They don't do a lot of fighting. It's mostly funding and help and stuff like that. But still, it's easy for the, for the, for the Red Army to turn around and say, see, all of these other countries are our enemies, and they're trying to stop us from doing what we need to do as Russians. So it ends in communist control of Russia, the very first communist country in the modern world or in the world. Here's a map just to give you an idea of what it looked like. You know, here's the Bolsheviks sort of sitting in the middle, being attacked on all sides by these different white armies, some of which are fairly successful, but ultimately, you know, unsuccessful. All right. General uh, chronology here, starting with the March of the Women to a general strike, um, the establishment of a pro provisional government and the Tsar go, uh, abdicating the throne. Um, creation of the Soviets here, and Lenin shows up and provides these April theses, which you might see on the exam. Basically, what he says is that Marx had called for a worker revolution that, that was actually preceded by a by a bourgeois revolution, that the, that the middle class would actually overthrow their traditional um, aristocracy and create their own uh, government. And then that would be overthrown by the workers. And, and Lenin came in and said, hey, we don't need to do this. We don't need to go through this. We can have the workers overthrow everybody, but they need to be led by some really dedicated and, and, um, and uh, you know, well-meaning and strong-willed kind of guys. Um, the Bolsheviks gained majorities here, overthrow the central government and, and by November, um, and then Lenin disbands the newly to be elected constituent assembly, um, gets out of the war and fights a long civil war. All right. So here we go to the last end of the war. Well, Germany, now that every, not all the, now that all of the armies have been freed up on the Western front, I'm just going to stop here.